one more minute. You can uh, put it like this. Uh, oh. Yeah, in here. Yeah, he, this is better. Uh, it's no problem. Yeah, it's very simple. I mean, there's no great technology. This not exactly. This change. to stand here yeah. okay we'll start according to this time okay this is time Okay, uh, good morning and welcome back to the third day of the symposium. Today's symposium is in honor of uh, our colleague, Professor Basudev Datta. So I will not take much time. Anyway, we will have reminiscence in the afternoon. For me, he is a very committed, dedicated uh, personality and sincere and honest to the core. Some of the qualities uh, which all of us should uh, learn from Basudev. We'll talk more about him in the afternoon. Right now, I call, invite uh, Professor Siddharth Gardin to take care of the proceedings of the day. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much and welcome all to this symposium in honor of Professor Basudev Datto on topology and combinatorics. And we are starting appropriately with, uh, as Matt Sinet tells me, by a factor of three or so, Basudev's closest collaborator, Bhaskar Bakchi, whom most of you would know is a very versatile mathematician who's worked in many fields besides combinatorial topology and operator theory, analytical number theory. And today it's going to be combinatorics and finite geometry. So today's talk is on the uniqueness conjecture. Thank you. Oops. OK, thanks for that for nice introduction. And thanks all the organizers for inviting me here and to give, give me the opportunity to speak on this very special occasion. Celebrating Bashudev's long and great career. So I'll be yeah. I'll, I guess I will be the geometry part of this workshop because mine is, I suppose, the only one on geometry. In fact, it's not it's not a topic on which Basudev himself has worked. Yeah, but but I will go to and fro like that. I can't stand in one place and lecture. I see. Okay. So let me introduce the main main actor in this little story. First of all, an incident system. The pair, say P comma L. Two sets. P is called the set of points. L is called the set of lines. So, so their sets says that P is a subset of sorry. L is a subset of 
to power p the power set up p that is the elements of l are subset subtils certain subsets of p. so i repeat the elements of p are called the points and the elements of l are called the lines of the incidence system now if if here such an incidence system is called a partial linear space any two points any two distinct points are in at most one leg and it's called a linear space if any two distinct points are in a unique line so you can think of, for example, all the usual lines in the usual Euclidean plane, for example. That's a linear space. In particular, a partial linear space. Not in particular, more than <laughs> okay, whatever. Now one a partial linear space is of order n. N is a positive integer if each point is in exact exactly n plus one lines. Then we say it is a border N. Oh god, this is this is coming to mistakes. Uh, no, never mind. Uh, so obviously an arbitrary partial linear space doesn't need to have an order. But if. But in this case, one can conclude. That is for a partial linear space of order n. Its line. Has size. Less than equal to n plus one. Why? Let me give a proof by picture. So you have a line with a certain number of points on it. Take a point outside. I'm assuming n is positive, so there will always be a point outside. Yeah. Look at the lines joining. Sorry, I'll. Sorry, not in this case. For a linear space, I mean. In a linear space of order in. If it's a linear space, then for each point, this is a fixed point, fixed line. And look at the joining lines. There may be some more lines. But at least this. If the linear, if the line con contains k points, then you see that there are at least, at least k lines through x. So the order being n, yeah, that is a linear space. For a linear space, you need that. I made a mistake actually, so I'm quickly correcting myself. Yeah, in general, for a partial linear space, you can define this, the order. Yeah, replaced by exactly one. So in a linear space of order n, its line will have size less than equal to n plus one because of this picture. And it follows. There are at most n square plus n plus one lines. Sorry, points. The lines also actually, but that will need more arguments. <coughs> Why? Another picture. It's a point. Look at all the lines through that point. 
okay apart from this point the lines there are n plus 1 lines each of them cover at most n points yes yeah uh, sorry whoever has raised your hands can you unmute and speak hello good morning um, i just wanted to uh, hear again what did uh, we say what is a linear space a linear space is a incident system in which any two distinct points are together in at most in exactly one lane okay. like the usual euclidean plane that's a linear space okay thank you but of course the usual euclidean plane is an infinite structure it has order infinity if you like but i'm mostly thinking of finite structures here all right yeah why why this because fix any point and look at the n plus 1 lines through them each of them cover at, at most n points in other points so n into n plus 1 plus 1 then square plus n plus 1 is a bound and you can see a linear space of order n with meeting this bound is called a projective plane of order n So because of the argument proving that in general there are at most n square plus n plus 1 points, it will follow that every line has size n plus 1. And if you think a little more, you'll see that any, because of this argument, in the case of equality, any two lines will meet in one point. So there's a kind of duality in this case. Now, because of this argument, one can see a projective plane of order n. Is a linear space with the following property. Any two points in unique play, unique line, unique common line, that is, any two lines meet in a unique point, of course. Yeah, so I think. Half my time will be taken using this. There are n square plus n plus one point n square plus n plus one points. <laughs> Same number of lines one can argue quite easily. Each point will be in n plus one lines. Of course, that's order n. And 
its line sub size n plus one. So that is its line contains n plus one points. So you see you have a kind of duality. If you interchange the notion of points and lines, you get another projective plane order, order n. What are some examples? I take it that all of you know the usual projective planes over real numbers, the real projective plane or complex numbers, or so on, or even something non commutative like quaternions. What is the notation? H, I guess. Good. Or is that octanion? Whatever. So those are some usual examples. More generally, these are of course infinite examples. Over any field, or even division link. Something like the quaternions. So that works for any field. In particular, I can use finite fields. Then I will get my finite examples. If Q is a prime power, then we have the field FQ, which is unique of order Q. And P of FQ, the projective plane over FQ, is an example of a finite projective plane of order Q. So you see, for every prime power, there is a projective plane of order Q, whenever Q is a prime power. And there's a famous conjecture, perhaps the most famous in finite geometry, combinatorics, that the order of a finite projective plane has got to be a prime power, but nobody knows really. But there's another conjecture, not so famous, that if Q is a, if the order is a prime, then up to the obvious notion of isomorphism, there is only one projective plane of order of, of that prime order, namely P of a P. So that is the conjecture I want to talk about. You see, when Q is a genuine prime power, meaning P, P power something bigger than one, then one can part up algebraically the field of Q to get something which are sufficiently close to, to, to a field to work in place of a field, and one gets other projective planes. Except in the case Q equal to four and eight, this gives distinct projective planes up to isomorphism. But when Q is a prime, nobody knows any such trick to part up the uh, field of a uh, prime order to get some, something which is sufficiently field-like to work here. That is what I want to talk about. If P is a prime, the only projective plane of order P, I'm sorry about that. 
proliferation of peas. The only basically plan about a P is P of a P. Uh, actually, this is a. I, get, I suppose it's a very old conjecture. I'm sure many of you have heard of von Strott, German mathematician. He's famous for his formula for the fractional part of Fibonacci numbers. I'm sorry for of the what numbers are there, and now I'm confused. The most famous numbers in Bernoulli, Bernoulli numbers. Von Strott has a famous formula for the fractional part of Bernoulli numbers. That same Von Strott wrote a book in German, I think in the 19, in the 18th century, I think, the 18th century or maybe early 19th century, where he first constructed the projective plane supply model like this. Okay. Later on, Fano generalized that construction to prime power orders very soon afterwards. In fact, the smallest projective plane that awarded two is called the Fano plane in his honor. I suppo suppose would after it would have this conjecture would have occurred to people because it's nobody has succeeded in constructing any project plane of prime order except these ones. But nobody knows really. P less than 11 was the same thing. P less than equal to 7. P is a prime for me throughout. Even for P equal to 11, it is open. Now, you won't see it stated in many places. Although it's among experts, it's quite famous. Textbooks or whatever source you try to see will usually say that for prime orders, only one example is known and leave it at that. It's what is called a folklore conjecture. Everybody knows, but nobody wants to acknowledge it. Up to seven, two, three, five, seven. Great. Yeah, that's well, well mixed. Up to up to seven. Yeah, no, for the, yeah, for prime year. For prime year, up to seven, one can, one can give conceptual proofs. Yes, but one proof for every case. Very different proofs. But, but believe me, it's a very hard conjecture. So hard that very that well, I shouldn't say very few people. Nobody has worked on it almost. In fact, if you look look up the uniqueness conjecture for projective planes of prime order, in, in, and if you do a Google search, you will only find find my one paper, <laughs> which was published in 2019. That, that's because it's very hard, not because people are not interested in it. I don't do much actually. I'm not trying to take credit. What do I do? Well, there's a very famous technique here in design theory generally using codes. So I'll have to give an introduction to codes. Very quick introduction to codes. Take any incident system. It P be a prime. The prime and the incident system doesn't have to have doesn't have to do anything to with each other. X is an arbitrary incident system. Finite. I'm interested in finite ones here. And P is an arbitrary prime.
<coughs> Look at the vector space over FP of all functions from this point set to this field FP. That's a vector space in the natural way. The PRD code of the insulin system. Is the subspace. <coughs> generated by. The lines. In. On X. What do I mean? I identify any line with its characteristic function. With a with the function L from P to FP, that L of X is one if X belongs to L and zero otherwise. The characteristic function, except that we are we are thinking it as taking values in FP. So th this becomes this becomes the lines become this way, the elements of this vector space. So they generate a subspace called that the code of the PRE code of X. For arbitrary incident systems, the PRE code doesn't say much. Usually it will be trivial and uninteresting. By the way, you might ask why code? It's just a subspace to subspace. Actually, there's a natural distance on this vector space, P to the power FP. And one is primarily thinking of that subspace as a metric subspace. What is that natural distance? Well, one has the Hamming weight of any function is the size of the support of the function. And the distance between two functions is the Hamming weight of the difference. So Hamming weight is serving like a norm here. Hamming weight, I, remember, I think that if F is a function in this big vector space, they are usually called code words, by the way. If F is a function like that, then the set of all points x where f of x is non-zero, the support of f, look at its size, that is the Hamming weight of the function f, or the code word f. Those are words, but... Yeah, these are error correcting codes, right? What I call block codes. But it's related, I mean, there are relations. Good codes in this sense can be used as good codes in that sense, like like that. All right. So It's a metric space, and in fact, uh, vector addition translation acts as isometries because of the way it, the metric is defined.
well, some well known results, not too hard to prove, not trivial. Again, the P of order P. Is correct. OK, P plus one choose P plus one. The dimension is P plus one choose two plus one. And the auto complement or dual code. In the usual sense, with the rather natural inner product, it's not an inner product really, just a non degenerate bilinear form. So, this dual code is of code dimension one in the original code of the plane. I would project it from the prime order. Uh, this is one place where prime order is special. This theorem is not true if P is not a prime, the order is not a prime. So that gives us a little wedge into the uniqueness conjecture, maybe. So we'd like to see. This is well known. Actually, Asmus and Asmus and Key have a famous book called uh, Designs and Their Codes. That's a very good reference for all these things and much more. One corollary is something which you can call the recognition lemma. That if you take any word or vector in this big vector space, ambient vector space, p to the power fp, then this will be in p of pi, pi the project, pi any projective plane of order p, if and only if summation w of x, x in L is a constant. All lines constant depending on that word, of course, or constant depending on W. So that's not hard to deduce. So that also is this corollary is also well known. <laughs> These special things are happening when we are looking at the PRD code of a projective plane of order P. P is any prime. P is a. Of course, yeah, I didn't say um, how much can I write. Um, C is any constant. C is some constant depending on W. For some constant, C would be the complete sentence. There is a clock somewhere here, no? Let me introduce one definition.
partial linear spaces. Take, take any two partial linear spaces, X and Y, finite, finite. Then the inclusion number I X comma Y is the number of isomorphic copies. Of X and Y. That's the definition. Another definition is. Oh, this this I is not that I, of course. Take any word W in a P to the power P, any vector. Its type is the multi index I equal to I, I sub alpha alpha in a P where. I sub alpha is the number of points X such that WX equal to alpha. So remember W is actually a function and its type is counting or recording how many times various values occur. Let C sub I be the number of words in city of Phi. Phi for me is an arbitrary projective plane of order P now. That's that. Its type is I. Let that do, let's CI denote that for various multi indices I of the appropriate size. And look at the polynomial in P variables X0, X1, X, XP minus 1, or X alpha, alpha in a P. The obvious one now. By bedding over all possible multi indices is called the complete weight enumerator. The complete weight enumerator of pi. Actually, one can define the complete weight enumerator for any code, but in particular for the PRE code, we have the complete weight enumerator. It's a function in P variables. Over integers actually. Complete weight enumerator. So please remember these two definitions in inclusion number of X and Y. Of course, X may not be included in, in Y at all. Then the number is zero, no problem. <coughs> In this paper of mine, which appeared in 2019, uh, what journal is that? Uh, Designs, Codes, and Cryptography. 
There is your cryptography. They are related. <laughs> In that journal, it appeared in 2019. The major theorem was this. P prime and pi is a projective plane of order P. Yeah. Take any part, so take any projective plane of order P. The important thing is, is any, okay? Although we know only one, take any hypothetical projective plane of order P. Take any partial any partial linear space X with at most log P points, log P lines, I'm sorry. Then the inclusion number of X in Pi, how many times? That linear, that partial linear space occurs as a subsystem of pi, is determined by the complete weight and nature of the PID code of pi. In fact, this inclusion number can be written as a linear combination of the various coefficients of of the com uh, complete complete weight and inversion of pi with rational coefficients de depending only on the linear, uh, partial linear space x and the prime p not on pi that is important i'm sorry i just don't have the time to go into the proof at all it's a, i think although i'm advertising myself i mean the people everybody does that these days <laughs> so uh, but it's a very beautiful proof, I think. The, how does the proof go? It, it goes via that recognition lemma. That's an Im important ingredient. Another important ingredient is the following trivial sounding number theory lemma. Any positive integer n, if you write as a sum of powers of two, then how many powers of two do you need? The obvious result is you need at least as many as there are binary, no, no, I mean, as as there are powers of two in the binary expansion of the number. That plays a very crucial role here. And <coughs> one of the referees told that this bound log two p comes in because of the because of the nature of the proof. It's not intrinsic. Perhaps not important, but surely without any bound, it would not be this, this would not be correct. You see what this is saying essentially is the, one would imagine that the once you take the linear span of the lines from the code, you lose most of the information. But this is saying that much of the structure of pi of the projective plane is well remembered by the complete weight and numerator alone. For every small partial linear space, how many times it's occurring? As a as a corollary to this, if p is bigger than five hundred and twelve, which is two power nine, bigger than equal to actually cannot be equal prime. 
and I is a projective plane of order P. Such that uh, complete weight enumerator of pi coincides with the complete weight enumerator of U of P. Then time must be isomorphic to P of P. So, in order to prove the uniqueness conjecture, at least for large enough primes, bigger than 512, it suffices to compute the complete weight and emerger of an arbitrary of an unknown projective planar prime order and compare it with the complete weight and emerger of this guy. Well, that's actually a very big ask. We don't know the complete weight enumerator of this this known projective plane prime order even, except for very small primes. Hmm. So uh, I'm not so I'm not claiming any big credit for this, but it's a it shows that the coding theory approach ought to work. In fact, I have conjectures, will proving much stronger version of this corollary. I mean, conjectures stating much much stronger versions, which will which ought to suffice. But it's it's just a line of attack. In fact, the title of my paper is a coding theoretic approach to the uniqueness conjecture for positive plane sub prime order. Okay, now let me tell you a little bit. I am running out of time. I know that. Uh, where is it again? Uh, I'm uh, actually I'm off. Um, just a minute. How does one prove this corollary? Well. There is a famous result, essentially a variation of the result of Hilbert, which says in particular that for a, for a very special partial linear space X called the Pappas, Pappas configuration, if you know I X pi, that is enough to determine, to decide whether it is isomorphic to. In fact, one, the result is that if pi is any Projective planar border in, then we have a bound on I X pi. As a, a, a bound is a polynomial in N, non polynomial in N, such that if the bound is attained, if and only if that, that unknown projective plane is isomorphic to a field projective plane. So I mean, that's not how that uh, this theorem is called Pappas theorem. Pappas or Pappus, I don't know. It depends. But uh, it's, uh, it's the close cousin of, but in fact, Pappas theorem characterizes uh, projective planes over fields, whereas Hilbert's original theory theorem characterizes is a similar characterization for projective planes over division rings. But of course, in the finite case, the two planes same. And because this Pappas configuration has nine lines and nine points, that bound to power nine comes up. Nine has to be less than or equal to log of p for, for this argument to work. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Online, any questions? Yeah, yeah. Provided this theorem applies, so that, so that the nine, the number of lines in the that nine, the number of lines of that purpose configuration is yeah. less than equal to p is necessary for that for this argument to go through. Yeah, it's yeah. No, people have tried it. Actually, uh, 
possible okay i think people like you should look at it <laughs> but what i have read for example the asmus key book says that it's an impossibly difficult problem even for modern computers and of course that you, that you can do only for small orders i mean you cannot but but it might give some I mean, unlikely but it might give some yeah counter <laughs> okay we'll talk about that later thank you thank you Oops, <laughs> I, I always do that. This one is easier. Ah, uh, yeah. Get the title. Oh, I should check. Uh, I hope I'm audible online. I can't. I'm the one checking uh, here. Okay, that was a wonderful start to this symposium. Our second speaker uh, who has signed in is uh, Ben Burton from University of uh, Wick, um, in Brisbane. So University of Victoria in Brisbane, he works in algorithms for knot theory and three manifold topology and so on, and not just the theory he has been. So these can recognize the knot and a big breakthrough was by Ben's advisor, Haim Rubinstein, which is recognizing the three sphere. And Ben has been involved in not only the theory, but actually implementation for 20 years, at least, I think. Uh, well, at least I first knew in, of his software from about 20 years ago. He has collaborated with Vasudev and visited our department as well. So today is going to talk about the power of cheap tricks using combinatorial structure in topological software. Yeah, Ben, can you share your screen and start? Hi. Um, yeah, so thank you. It's a, a pleasure to be here. I hope uh, you can all hear me, yes? Yeah, we can hear you first. Yes. Excellent. Um, yeah, so it's a pleasure um, a pleasure to talk here uh, and a pleasure to be a part of Vasudev Retirement Party. Um, I, it is retirement, yes? Yes, yes. Yes, wonderful. Okay. Um, so, uh, and I, I wish I could be there in person, but um, yeah, I guess what I want to talk about today is uh, an intersection of the, the sorts of things that Vasudev likes to think about, which is which is the, the combinatorics of topology and the, the sort of and the, the mix of these with simplicial complexes and triangulations um, and how this interacts with actual concrete software. Um, so that's that's really that's uh, and in particular how it can make your software sort of faster when it shouldn't be and more effective when it shouldn't be. So um, maybe I will just get my face off here and share my screen and start talking. Um, uh, are we there? We're there. Um, Okay, so uh, yeah, so what I'm what I'm talking about here is software, um, but what I'm really talking about somehow is is the gap between software. So what I mean here is practice uh, versus uh, what we know in theory, and in particular, I'm interested in running times. Um, so the framework here is three dimensional manifolds, four dimensional manifolds. Uh, and knots. And so let me just throw up some examples uh, of this gap between between theory and practice. Um, so uh, a, a big problem is unknot recognition. So the idea of unknot recognition, you're looking for a program where the input is a knot diagram and the output is either yes, it's equivalent to the unknot, or no, it's not equivalent to the unknot. Um, so this is an old problem uh, with an old solution. Uh, due to Harkin um, in the 1960s. Uh, and the algorithm for this has improved over, over 60 years since then. Um, and it's actually, it's improved a lot. So the, the theoretical bounds on this problem, um, until recently, so until recently, uh, this problem, the best running time was known to be um, exponential. So uh, alpha to the n, where alpha is a constant, and n is the number of crossings uh, in the knot diagram. Um, when I say until recently, uh, very recently, um, Mark Lackenby uh, has produced an algorithm which is, I think it's quasi-polynomial, 
Um, so it's, it's in theory much faster. Um, we don't know what it's like in practice because I don't think anybody has coded it up. Um, so the implementations that you see uh, online will use this, this exponential, uh, exponential time algorithm because they are somehow, they're worse in theory, but they're simpler to code. Um, but the point is that although this is exponential time in theory, in practice, uh, the implementation of this algorithm has gotten so good if you use the right software engineering and the right kinds of tricks in the algorithms and data structures. In practice, this is, I want to say, always polynomial. Um, what do I mean by always polynomial? What I mean is um, you run it through uh, thousands and thousands of cases coming from different places and you measure the running times of all of these and the running times of all of these follow a fairly, fairly precise polynomial curve. It's somewhere between n to the 5 and n to the 6. Um, so I'm, I'm sure it is still exponential, this particular algorithm. Uh, it's still exponential in practice, but finding an actual case that shows the exponential behavior is extremely difficult to the point where I don't, I don't know any. Um, so this is, a, this is a wonderful example of this gap between, between theory and practice. Um, Another example is the, uh, the homeomorphism problem for three manifolds. Um, so this is where you're looking for a program uh, which takes as input a pair of manifolds, M1 and M2, and it outputs either yes, according to whether these two manifolds are homeomorphic, um, or no, according to whether they're not. Um, so this problem didn't even have an algorithm until uh, this millennium, um, because the algorithm relies on the geometrization conjecture, which is now the geometrization theorem. Um, so since Perelman uh, in 2002, 2003, we now have an algorithm to solve this problem. The algorithm is fantastically complicated. Um, nobody has ever coded it up. Uh, it does have a theoretical running time, uh, and the theoretical running time is a tower of towers. Well, pardon me, it's a tower of exponentials. So the running time looks like this, where n is the input size. We know there is a bound to how tall this tower is, but we don't know what the bound is. Yeah. So this is the theoretical running time. And this is the best theoretical running time that I think we have still at this point in time. Um, Someone please correct me if I'm wrong. So this bound is due to Cooperberg. Um, Greg Cooperberg uh, around 2015, I think. So that's the theory. In practice, in practice, people solve this problem all the time. So for hyperbolic manifolds, um, for hyperbolic manifolds, uh, the software Snappy, um, can you can ask it, are these manifolds homeomorphic? Um, and Snappy will either say yes, or it will say, I don't know. So this is not a complete solution, but when it says yes, um, it gets this right frequently. Um, well, pardon me. I mean, if, if the manifolds are not homeomorphic, it won't say yes. If it says yes, it's correct. And the point is when they are homeomorphic, it actually does recognize this very often. And not only does it do it very often, it does it very quickly. Um, Regina, uh, the software of Regina um, can, uh, I mean, somehow it, it doesn't have a button to recognize whether two manifolds are homeomorphic, but also um, what you can do is uh, it's been used. Um, so, so myself and Matt have been independently produced uh, 12 tetrahedron censuses of closed prime manifolds. And I, I'm not sure if either of us have ever written this up, but it's, the data has been sitting there for a decade, um, but these are censuses where you build all, all closed manifolds um, with at most 12 tetrahedra, and you classify this according to isomorphism, uh, according to homeomorphism. So all of the manifolds in the census, and there are a lot of them, um, all of them you can conclusively determine whether they are uh, homeomorphic or not. And so this is something that Although, in theory, this should be completely um, inaccessible to computers, it's something that you can actually do if you need to, if you have good software and good humans driving the software. So this is another example of this, this enormous gap between 
theory and practice. Um, I want to give one more example between the gap, uh, with the gap between theory and practice, and this is with homeomorphism of four manifolds. And so now we're looking for, and I'm going to copy the same, uh, I'm going to copy the same picture. Um, so now we're looking for an algorithm uh, which will take two manifolds in four dimensions uh, and determine whether or not they're homeomorphic. Um, and the theoretical bound, oh, I beg your pardon, is that a question? Okay, sorry, I thought I heard something. Um, if there are questions, uh, I cannot see the Teams screen because I'm sharing this on my iPad. So if there are questions or comments, um, please just uh, shout out because otherwise I won't know. Um, so I was asking Regina, is it using normal surfaces or some uh, hyperbolic triangulations or something for the homeomorphism problem? Um, it's using a mix of techniques. So it's, it's okay. definitely using, it's using normal surfaces. It's using combinatorial recognition, which I will talk about shortly. Um, okay. It's using hyperbolic geometry. Um, it's using it's basically doing whatever it can get its hands on um, <laughs> to try and find a conclusive solution. And like yeah. Snappy, it doesn't promise to yeah. get a conclusive solution, but it does it often enough that it's it's genuinely useful. Um, uh, sorry, and Snappy, you were saying. So, are there cases known where things are homeomorphic, but Snappy fails to recognize them? Meaning? Um, so, I run into these sorts of cases all the time. Um, oh, when okay. I say all the time, I mean, for instance, doing. Uh, Okay, so what, what happens with Snappy, the way Snappy does this uh, is there is, for any given uh, hyperbolic manifold, there is a what's called a canonical cell decomposition. So there's a way of using the hyperbolic geometry to produce what is essentially a triangulation of your space, um, which is unique up to homeomorphism. So that, like the homeomorphism type, determines the triangulation. So Snappy builds this, but sometimes it gets it wrong. So Snappy guarantees that the triangulation it produces is a triangulation of the correct manifold, but it doesn't guarantee that it is the canonical triangulation. Right. So when you ask Snappy if these two manifolds are homeomorphic, it builds the canonical triangulation and compares them. So if the canonical triangulations match, the answer is yes. If they don't match, either the answer is no, or it got the canonical triangulation wrong. And, and when I say I find these cases often, I say this when I'm working through like a billion not complements. And in a billion not complements, you're going to get, you know, maybe tens of thousands of cases where it doesn't work. So that's a lot of cases where it doesn't work, but they're still rare in the scale of a billion triangulations. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, so for four manifolds, um, the theoretical bound on the running time in four dimensions is that this problem is undecidable. Um, in the sense that there is a theorem that says that there is no algorithm that can solve this problem correctly all the time. Um, and this is a result that's due to Markov um, in the 1960s. Um, in practice, um, and this is this is the early days, but in practice, um, you have a census uh, of all uh, four manifolds that can be built up to six pentacora. Um, and there's, whoa, uh, and there's, there's not nearly as many of them. I mean, there's, there's, ah, I forget the order of magnitude. Um, Rodi, if you're online, then feel free to unmute and give me the order of magnitude because I don't remember. I think it's either tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands. Um, but, uh, but the point is that you can, um, ben, you can actually, can you yes? hear me? It's oh, 400,000. Yes. Four hundred thousand. Oh, that's uh, yes. Jonathan. Okay, Jonathan. Um, of course, Jonathan's in the room. Um, so there's four hundred thousand of these things, um, and you can classify all of those up to homeomorphism. Despite the fact that the problem is unsolvable, you can still, with the right algorithms and data structures, um, actually get your hands on on results for all of these cases that you would like to. Um, and so this is this is work uh, sort of maybe a decade ago. Um, uh, uh, joint work with Ryan Budney, um, and then sort of more recently, uh, joint work with Rody Burke. Um, so, so again, this is an example of a problem which you shouldn't be able to solve, but you can in practice. So, so that's the that's the scene that I'm trying to set. Um, so, what I want to talk about is some of the ways that these practical results 
are made possible. Um, there are a lot of tricks you can use, um, and some of it comes down to good choice of algorithms. Uh, some of it comes down to good software engineering. You absolutely, you cannot just code the thing up and hope. What you have to do is code the thing up, be careful about the algorithms that you choose, be careful about the data structures, be careful about how you optimize your code, and then shut your eyes and hope. And, and happily, this, this works much more often than it should. Um, but having said all of that, what you would really like to do is avoid using expensive algorithms completely. So for example, unknot recognition, um, if I give you a pair of knots and they have different Alexander polynomials, then you know that the answer is no. And the Alexander polynomial, I believe is polynomial time um, to compute. I, could, I hope I'm right. Um, and so in that case, uh, you have a polynomial time answer that where you can say no some of the time. A lot of the time, the Alexander polynomials will be the same, so it's not good enough and you have to do more work. But this is what I mean by a cheap trick. So maybe let me now sort of really talk about these things. So cheap, what, cheap tricks, um, so when I talk about cheap tricks, what I mean is um, methods, methods for avoiding Avoiding expensive algorithms entirely. And I'm sorry, I'm half computer scientist. So when I say expensive, um, that's a polite word for slow, right? Um, so methods for avoiding expensive algorithms entirely. So let me give you a, a poster child example of a cheap trick. So this is unknot recognition. <clears throat> so unknot recognition. Um, so once again, your input is a knot diagram. Uh, and then, uh, I'm missing a bit. Anyway, the input is a knot diagram and the output is either yes or no, according to whether this knot is uh, equivalent to the unknot. Um, so here's a cheap trick. So you triangulate the knot complement. So you're triangulating S3 minus the knot. So you're taking the three speed, you're drilling the knot out. What's left is a three manifold with boundary, um, and you construct that out of tetrahedra. Then you simplify the triangulation using simple heuristic. So examples of simple heuristics are bistellar flips. Um, and if you don't know what bistellar flips are, um, an example of a bistellar flip is taking, uh, if you've got an edge with three tetrahedra surrounding the edge, so sort of one, two, three tetrahedra surrounding the edge, um, then what you do is you replace it um, with a pair of tetrahedra one on top of each other. So this does not change anything outside the local picture. Locally, you've found an edge of degree three, you've replaced the three surrounding tetrahedra with a pair of tetrahedra, and there's now a, um, an internal face in between. Uh, and this will give you the same manifold with one fewer tetrahedron. So these kinds of cheap, uh, these simple moves are easy to find. Um, and basically you do them until you can't do any more. And then what do you do? You, um, you check to see if the number of tetrahedra in your triangulation is one. Um, if you live in the world of simplicial complexes, of course it won't be one, um, but we use much, much tighter definitions of triangulations. So you can actually get it down to a single tetrahedron a lot of the time. And I will, I will talk a bit about this shortly. Um, so you see if your simplification got it all the way down to one tetrahedron, and if so, and if the triangulation is the, I'm going to say the standard one tetrahedron uh, solid torus, that is the one tetrahedron unknot complement, then you say yes. If not, then you use your expensive algorithm. 
So the point of this is that in many, 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 and by this I mean vastly most cases, where you give a diagram of the unknot, um, you construct the complement and you simplify it, you will actually get down to this standard one tetrahedron solid torus. So if you have the unknot, almost all the time in practice, this works. So it actually, the simplification tricks are so useful that it gets it right down to one tetrahedron, and then you can just see the answer because it's a case that you already know the answer to. And you avoid the expense of algorithms completely. Um, and this is one of the reasons why unknot recognition is, is so fast in Regina is because most of the time, this is really all that's going on. Right? Um, Sorry, I so, have a question here. So in this yes. case, you're saying it's half fast. That is, if it is actually an unknot, do you have a fast way to recognize it, right? But if it turns yes, out to be the... knotted, you're forced to use the expensive algorithm. Yes, yes, yes. Although there's 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 another asterisk on this too. So if it's... I mean, there um, you could use snappy, I guess, and check that it's hyperbolic or something, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is and this is what you're doing in practice, right? So it's if it... if it, um, So testing whether it's hyperbolic, um, you don't want to use snappy for that because snappy... Uh, uh, Snappy has issues surrounding exact arithmetic, unless you're you're using these extensions that plug into Sage, and then there's sort of more heavy machinery going on. But but sort of Snappy on its own doesn't use exact arithmetic. Um, so sometimes it may think it's hyperbolic, but it's not, and sometimes it may think it's not hyperbolic, but it is. So that's a that's a problem you have to run into. But you can use what's called angle structures, which are a simple way of detecting hyperbolicity. Um, in polynomial time because it runs a single linear program and if it finds an angle structure then that's a certificate an exact certificate that it's hyperbolic and then you can stop and you don't need to pull out snappy with its with its floating point error problems um, and you don't need to run any expensive algorithms so that's another another sort of less cheap but still reasonably cheap trick um, but but the short answer is to what you're saying is yes this this trick only works when the answer is yes it's the unlock okay, but thanks. there are other easy ways of detecting that it's not the unlock. Um, so, okay, so that's, that's, this is the sort of thing that I mean by cheap tricks. Um, so what I want to talk about here really is, is some things that are, uh, I, I, I guess, cheap tricks, there are a lot of cheap tricks that come from looking at the combinatorial structure of triangulations. And, and I talk about combinatorial structure. This is something that is useful for this sort of implementation problem. It's also something that uh, Abbasidev has been thinking about for, for a very long time. He has a lot of papers on the, on the combinatorics of triangulations of manifolds. And what I want to highlight is that this, this sort of work is not just theoretical. It's, it's also it's useful in practice. Um, so I'm, I'm basically from here to the end of the talk, I'm going to talk through some, some examples of what these tricks look like. Um, Okay, so before I go on, let me talk about more exactly what I mean by triangulations. Now, I think a lot of you like to think about simplicial complexes. Um, when I talk about triangulations, I really just mean uh, you take a collection of tetrahedra, um, and then one at a time, you pick two of their faces and you glue them together. So, so you pair off the faces and glue the triangles together, and this will give you some three-dimensional object. If you're lucky, it's a three-manifold, um, and if you're very lucky, it's a three-manifold that represents what you want. So this is kind of a three-dimensional analogy to a two-dimensional picture of a torus, where if you're in the world of simplicial complexes, I think you need, is it seven? I thought it was seven. Someone told me today it was 14 um, tetrahedra to build a solid, uh, sorry, triangles to build a torus. Um, for these kinds of triangulations, you need just two triangles to build a torus. So what you do is you take a square, you glue the opposite edges of the square together, and then you take a diagram. So this is a two triangle description of a torus. So it's got one vertex, three edges, and two triangles. Yeah? So all of my three-dimensional triangulations are basically a three-dimensional analogy of this idea. It's just another way of picturing this is I give you a pair of triangles. I say glue this edge to this edge, glue this edge to this edge, and glue this edge 
to this edge. And that's a solid torus. Uh, that's a, sorry, that's a two dimensional torus. So this is what I mean by triangulations. Um, now let me give you one of the simplest, uh, and in fact, what, what I mean by this standard one tetrahedron solid torus, and what the standard one tetrahedron solid torus looks like is the following. You take a single tetrahedron, you glue two of the faces together to each other, so that if this is A, B, C, D, you're going to glue A, B, C to B, C, D. So this edge, this edge, and this edge are all the same. This edge and this edge are all the same. The vertices all end up in the same place. So this is one vertex. Um, there's three edges. And there's three triangles. The reason there's three triangles is there's the two on the front that are glued together, and then there's two boundary triangles on the back. I promise you this is a solid torus. Uh, why is it a solid torus? Here is a way you can think of it as a solid torus. Um, build, yourself, uh, build yourself a Mobius band. Right? You can build a Mobius band out of a single triangle by doing this. So what does that look like on this picture? On this picture, it looks like um, there's a vertex, and then you have a diagonal that sort of walks away from the vertex, goes through here, and comes back down. And so this, these two corners here sort of form these two corners of the triangle. And this corner here forms this corner of the triangle. So this is a Mobius band made out of a single triangle. Now, what I want you to do, what I want you to do is take a tetrahedron and put it on top of this face. Put it on top of this face, right? And let it fold over this edge. So you're sort of picking it up So that this, this edge here just sort of sits down on top of this edge here. Yeah. And these blue faces on the back become kind of these blue faces here. And then just let this bottom triangle fall onto the Mobius band and let this bottom triangle fall onto the Mobius band. And what you will find is that the triangle on this side will sort of fall over here and then fall all the way underneath here. This triangle on this side will fall on top here and then wrap all the way underneath here. And so by the time you've folded this, tri this tetrahedron on top of the Mobius band, you have a proper three-dimensional object. It's a three-dimensional object, which means what do you get when you fatten up the Mobius band? It becomes a solid torus. A thickened Mobius band is just a solid torus. So it's a solid torus, but there's only one tetrahedron. So let me just say, trust me, this construction here gives you exactly this triangulation here. All right, so that's the one tetrahedron solid torus. Um, you can build more and more solid tori in this sort of way. And these become what are called layered, um, layered solid tori. And so what you do is you build yourself a solid torus that has a boundary that is a torus. So there's some stuff going on under here. And then there's two boundary triangles. And what you're going to do is thicken up the boundary by taking a new tetrahedron and doing the same sort of trick as before. You're going to let this just fall on top so that this triangle here sits there. This triangle here sits there, and this edge on the back sort of sits across here. So the tetrahedron is basically going to fall across this red edge. So this thickens up the boundary and gives you more tetrahedra. 
And the result is you still have a solid torus, but now the edges are following different curves on the boundary. And you can keep doing this and layering and layering and layering and layering until you get a, a, a much larger solid torus where the boundary curves sort of follow all these crazy patterns um, around, the, around the, the boundary torus. So that's how you build a solid torus. Um, one way you can build a lens space. So if you don't know what a lens space is, a lens space is essentially what you get if you take a solid torus, another solid torus, and then glue the two boundaries together. Um, if you glue the two boundaries together in the obvious way, you just get uh, S3, pardon me, you get S2, uh, S2 cross, I'm going to say S2 cross S1. Um, but if you glue the boundaries together in a more interesting way, you can get all sorts of interesting manifolds. What do I mean by an interesting way? I mean, for instance, you might glue them together so that um, so that this curve here on the boundary becomes some more interesting curve on the boundary here. Yeah. So as these gluings become more interesting, you get different thin manifolds. Um, and so to build a lens space, what you can do is you can take this and build it out of a layered solid torus. You can take this, build out of a layered solid torus, and then you just glue the two boundaries together by taking the two triangles here and connecting them to the two triangles here. So this gives you a closed three-manifold triangulation. Um, the dual graph of this triangulation looks something like this. So the dual graph, there's one vertex for each tetrahedron, and there's one edge for each gluing between, uh, between faces. So the dual graph um, Basically, you're sticking a, a vertex in the center of each tetrahedron, and then you're putting in edges where the tetrahedra are glued together. So why am I talking about lens spaces? Because these are very nicely structured triangulations of a, of a, a lens space. So these pictures here, um, they're very well structured. Um, they have a lot of very nice combinatorial properties, and in particular, they are conjectured to be minimal. What do I mean by minimal? I mean that for all lens spaces, um, these give you uh, the smallest, ah, sorry, I'm struggling with the iPad here, um, the smallest number of tetrahedra. When I say they're conjectured to be minimal, um, in some cases, uh, these are actually known to be minimal. Um, and so there are theorems uh, by, um, so there, there are a few different papers on this, um, and the names that appear uh, include uh, Jaco, Rubenstein, uh, and Tillman. And then later on, I think there's another paper by Jaco, Rubenstein, Tillman, and Spreer. Um, uh, and, uh, and I think there's another paper on this sort of stuff that appeared on the archive yesterday, which I have yet to, to open up. But, um, but, but the point is that these are believed for every lens space. It is believed that if you can build the smallest possible triangulation, then it will be one of these. It will be one of these. So what does this say about algorithms? So if you want an algorithm to recognize a lens space, what do you do? You triangulate the space you simplify using your simple moves. So for instance, by stellar flips. Um, and if your simplification techniques are good enough, you just look and see if what you have is a layered solid torus glued to a layered solid torus. You look and see if this is what you actually have. And I promise you in many, many, and I'm gonna say again, most, cases that I have ever run across a lens space that I've wanted to recognize, in almost all of these cases, 
um, this has worked, right? You simply, you simplify the picture of the lens space, you look at the triangulation and you can see that it is one of these things. And if you can see that it is one of these things, you can pull apart the structure of the layered solid torus and you just look at the combinatorics of the triangulation and you can read off the name of the manifold. You can see exactly what the manifold is and you do not need to use any expensive algorithms. Um, the real algorithms, the expensive algorithms for recognizing lens spaces, um, I don't think this has ever been implemented. I could be wrong, but I don't think this has ever been implemented. So it is already the simple case of recognizing a lens space is messy enough that nobody has done it properly. So these two tricks, they're not just powerful, they're somehow, they're somehow necessary because we don't have the code um, to do things properly. Um, so when I say properly, I mean properly with a guarantee of getting an answer all the time. So this extends beyond lens spaces. Then you have, I mean, you have a, uh, spaces such as cyphered fibered spaces. Um, so what's a cyphered fibered space? It's basically where you take a surface cross S1. So you have a bundle of circles uh, running across a surface. And then you take a handful of these circles, you drill out, you drill out a solid torus. Whoops. You drill out uh, a solid torus, and then you put back in a different kind of solid torus. Um, and so there are very nice triangulations of these things where the surface cross S1 is built by triangulating the surface. And for each triangle, you produce a prism, a three tetrahedron uh, prism uh, with the top glued to the bottom. And so you fill the space with these prisms and then for each solid torus that you're pulling out and putting back in, you essentially pop open the prisms and stick in layered solid tori representing these, these extra drilling operations. So these again, they are well structured. They have very nice combinatorial properties. They are easy to recognize algorithmically. And so if you give me a manifold and you ask me to prove that it is non-hyperbolic, the first thing I will typically do is simplify the triangulation using these bistellar flips, look at it and see if, for example, it's one of these, right? Or one of these, or one of several other kinds of nicely structured, well-structured combinatorial uh, triangulations of these manifolds. And if it is, you can just read off the name of the manifold. And so how do you make this work? So to make this work more broadly, what do you need to understand? You need to understand how to build nicely structured triangulations aha, of spaces, of manifolds. And then you need to understand how to convert your triangulation into one of these things. Um, and this first part here is really, it's understanding the combinatorics of the manifold and how to, how to represent this using tetrahedra. Um, the second part of this is really a combination of, um, let's say, uh, bistellar, uh, bistellar flips and simplification. Um, but as the manifolds get more complex, this is not enough. So then you need to be able to be able to sort of walk, walk through a graph of, of related triangulations So for example, you take your simplified triangulation, you get something nice and simple, you don't recognize the structure, so then you start to do more bistellar flips. And then you get more and more triangulations and you basically walk through this, this graph of different triangulations, all of the same manifold, until you find one that has this kind of structure that you're looking for. So this, this kind of tricking 
is again it's, it's somehow it's very basic but also it's extremely powerful um regina has a ton of code that does this for all sorts of different manifolds um and it's proved extremely useful in practice um let me just say one more thing before i move on and this is in four manifolds um, so this is something that we are just starting to look at with four manifolds is similarly looking for nicely structured triangulations of closed four manifolds. Um, and again, remember that in general, this is a problem recognizing four manifolds, uh, which is undecidable in general. There is no algorithm to solve them. Um, so this, this is something that uh, Rody Burke is starting to, starting to look at at the moment. Um, and so he's looking at code uh, that is doing this kind of work in the four-dimensional setting, which is looking at triangulations of four-dimensional manifolds, pulling apart the combinatorics, trying to observe which substructures, which combinatorial substructures correspond to connected sums, uh, cones over three manifolds, um, CP squared sum ends, handle decompositions, and so on and so on, so that you can then write software which takes a four manifold as input, looks for these combinatorial structures, and then is able to tell you that this is a connected sum, these pieces have these names, uh, and do all of this without having to run any expensive, certainly undefinable uh, algorithmic machinery. So this is something that's very exciting um, that we're that looking forward to seeing, seeing where this goes um, in four dimensions. Uh, so, Look, I think I do want to leave a little bit of time for questions. So uh, I finish in four minutes, yes? So maybe maybe I will, <laughs> of the three things I was going to talk about, this is one of them, but I think this is the one that I most wanted to talk through. Um, so I will end it there. Um, and just as I finish, I, uh, once again, um, I'd just like to say it's been an absolute pleasure working with, uh, with Basideb. Uh, and I really, I, I enjoyed my, my visits to, to Bangalore a lot. Um, and I wish you uh, all, the way, all, all the best in your retirement. Um, and I do hope to see you around. Uh, despite your retirement, I hope to see you around um, somewhere in the future. So anyway, that will do for me. And I'm happy to take questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, that was a superb talk. Yeah. I was going to say, let's thank the speaker, but that became redundant. Everyone thanked the speaker already. Uh, any questions here from offline audience? Online, uh, anyone is welcome to unmute. Uh, I don't think. OK, I, I heard a couple. Yeah, sorry, Jonathan. Hi, um, so. With the four manifold, when you say um, you classified everything um, up to homeomorphism, do you mean homeomorphism or PL homeomorphism? Um, I just mean homeomorphism. Uh, PL is a work in progress. Sorry? Uh, I just mean homeomorphism. So PL homeomorphism is a work in progress. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yes. And and do you know like how many different homeomorphism types you find there? Okay. <sighs> Yes, and I don't remember, but it's a really small number. Like it's, like it's a handful. Like I could stand here and read them out to you. So it's okay. it's so up, yeah, it's it's not many. Um, I'm, I'm right. going to say let me let me say it's a two digit number. Okay. And if I'm wrong, then it's because it's a one digit number. Um, <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah, well, I had a couple of questions. One is that uh, so a lot of your things seem to depend on monotonic simplification. So there is this work of Dinikov and Berman and Menesco and so on with grid diagrams. Is there any you know any relation between uh, the bistellar moves you're using? Because there, there are known algorithms to recognize the unknot. Mm -hmm. Like Dinikov mm -hmm. says you can start with a grid diagram and you may have to make level moves, but you never have to complicate things. Uh, yeah. Do you know any case where you can say, hence you say the Nikos methods to say that you can need to uh, level moves are enough with uh, bystander moves? Ah, so, okay, so there's there's two answers. Um, so, okay, so there's simplifications of knot diagrams and there's simplifications of three manifold triangulations. Um, and these are independent problems. So, three manifold triangulations, uh, the Regina's, the, the heuristics that are implemented in Regina are monotonic. Um, they will make a very small number of level moves, but it bounds the number of level moves, so it won't make too many. Um, and it will it will do any any strict simplifications that it can. Uh, and these on their own 
are enough for what I said. So these are enough to get to that one tetrahedron triangulation really almost all the time. Um, and when I say that, it's not just doing bistellar flips. So it has a larger suite of moves that it uses. Um, so there's some combination moves, which together are monotonic, although if you broke them down into bistellar flips, they're not. Um, with knot diagrams, this is not possible. So with knot diagrams, you're right amongst the moves in many, many cases um, where you need to increase the number of crossings. Um, so having said that, uh, I've never tried Dinikov's methods, and there are two reasons. One is because uh, the grid diagram, as I understand it, the size of the grid diagram could be quadratic in the original number of crossings. Um, so, so constructing the grid diagram scares me off enough um, that I sort of worry that it's going to be so large. And the other thing is I, I don't have any – so I've, I've never tried this in practice, and Dinikov says you need level moves, and I don't know whether like – the, the bound on the number of level moves that you could need is, I think, factorial at each stage. I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Maybe it's only exponential. But I think at least in theory you could require a phenomenal number of level moves before you drop. And I don't know whether this is whether there's a theory practice gap there. And it's absolutely it's worth trying. It's worth trying, and I've never tried it. Is the answer the third answer? No, there is a third answer. Is is actually navigating the grid moves is much more expensive because, like for Reitermeister moves, for for the the simplification moves on triangulations in each local neighbourhood, there's only a very small number of things you can try. Right? You look for degree three edges, degree two edges, degree four edges. With writer master moves, you look for, for twists and, and triangles and, and bygones and one gones. Um, with grid diagrams, there's a much larger suite of moves that are possible. So it's somehow from any diagram, it really, the number of moves that you could be trying explodes much more dramatically. And so this, this does, this scares me off more than any of the other things. Because I think just searching through the moves could very quickly explode to a large search tree. Having said all of that, I haven't done it. Right? So, um, yeah. yeah. Oh, thanks a lot. Uh, a more general question. Uh, have you been, or has you, you or someone else been trying to integrate with, say, the lean theorem prover where the outputs become formal proofs? Oh, okay. Or um, equivalent system? There's two answers. Um, okay, so so there's three answers. The first is I, I'm not familiar with the, the lean theorem prover, I think you, you said. Yeah, so... Yeah. So the, the the second answer is that all of these techniques, okay, some of these techniques produce certificates that you can go back and recheck, um, and the certificates are small. Some of these techniques, the certificates are large. For instance, if you're using normal surface theory to prove that something is not uh, the other not, then the certificate is somehow the non-existence of a normal surface, which is a certificate of exponential size. Um, if you're if you're trying to uh, what's another example? Um, all of these cheap tricks give fast certificates, but some of the expensive algorithms don't. Um, and the third thing is, um, if you wanted to actually certify that the software is correct, um, there are half a million lines of code in Regina, and I would absolutely love to be able to certify, um, sort of using proper ver verification techniques, that this code is correct. Um, five, five and a half, uh, half a million lines of code, I don't know. I don't know how you would do it. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, exactly. Now, in principle, of course, this is going to, will be to take uh, many, many years, I suppose. Lean theorem prover is intended to be fast enough that the code could be written in that and then certified. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's obviously a huge task. Oh, OK. Yeah. Other questions? OK, let's uh, thanks a lot and let's thank the speaker once more. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so we break for 11.30 will be the next session.